Hello, fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you to study and teach the scriptures with more relevancy and power. This week, we're going to be covering 3 Nephi, chapters 1 through 7. And remember, teachers, if you're interested in getting access to the materials that I put together for teachers to help reduce your preparation time, increase your confidence in the classroom, and help you to create edifying classroom experiences, just go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. Now, if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. And for an object this week, I would just pick anything that has to do with Christmas. Pull out some of your decorations, place them at the front or around your classroom. A small fake Christmas tree, a nativity set, a wrapped gift, anything that gets them into the Christmas spirit. And then for an icebreaker, have some Christmas music playing as your class enters the room. Write Merry Christmas on the board or display a slide that has the message, Merry Christmas. And they may wonder what's going on, but just tell them that they'll find out. They're going to see. And once you begin, you can ask if anybody has figured it out yet. Why would we be talking about Christmas today? And if nobody understands, tell them that you're going to be studying 3 Nephi chapter 1 that day. And does that help? And if they still don't get it, you could explain that 3 Nephi chapter 1 contains the account of what happened here in the Americas when Jesus Christ was born. We sometimes forget that there are two Christmas stories in the scriptures. We've got the Old World account in Luke chapter 2, and some really amazing things happen here in the New World on that same sacred night. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. 3rd Nephi chapter 1 contains what I believe to be one of the most dramatic and powerful stories in the entire Book of Mormon. And you may wonder that since it's not usually pointed out as such, because the account that's given is a bit understated. And if you're not digging deep, we might miss its power. And to really feel the impact, you've got to visualize it. If it's true that we get a chance to witness significant moments in earth's history in the next life, this would be one of my first choices. And I'd introduce this chapter by asking my students what they feel is the true spirit of Christmas. There's there's a lot said about the true spirit of Christmas around the holidays. But what does that even really mean? When I was a child, I was told that the true spirit of Christmas was giving. Giving was the true spirit. But you know what? When you're a kid, you know better than that. Christmas is all about the getting. The magic of Christmas morning. Running down the stairs in my onesie pajamas with the feet in. The Christmas morning mayhem. All of the presents. The ripping and the tearing of wrapping paper. And ah, the joy of finally getting what I'd been asking for and anticipating for months. That new Lego set the Nintendo game, a CD player. Ah, receiving was so wonderful. But as I got older, the adults around me started to change my mind. They kept telling me that it was all about giving. And so I did service projects, and I bought my family members gifts, and I felt the joy that comes from doing things like that. And I decided that giving was the true spirit of Christmas. But you know what? I've changed my mind again. I'm reverting to my childish ways, and I've come to the conclusion that I had it right all along when I was a kid. I honestly believe that the true spirit of Christmas is the spirit of receiving or getting. And let me explain why. 3 Nephi chapter 1 plays a big part in my arrival at that conclusion. And I'd like to share this story in the way that I've heard my father do it. He can do it much better than I can. But approaching it in this way has always helped me to connect with and understand this story on a deeper, more personal level. 
you'll get more from the story if you put yourself in their shoes or their sandals. If you liken the scriptures to yourselves. So I want you to imagine that you are a faithful Nephite living in Zarahemla in the year 6 BC. And this is an extraordinary time to be alive. Relations between the Nephites and the Lamanites are actually good due to the incredible, powerful teaching of Nephi and his brother Lehi, the entire Lamanite nation has been converted. And you're living in a time of peace between these normally contentious groups. Unfortunately, though, among the Nephites, a new faction has begun to spring up, the Gadianton robbers. And they've successfully infiltrated Nephite society and influenced many with their unbelief, their skepticism, and their greed. Still, a number of faithful believers continue to uphold the church and a belief in a Savior that would one day come to save the earth. And I can't think of any other people in the scriptures whose faith was tested more sorely than the Nephite believers at this time. And Joseph Smith once said the following, You will have all kinds of trials to pass through. And it is quite as necessary for you to be tried as it was for Abraham and other men of God. And God will feel after you. And he will take hold of you and wrench your very heartstrings. And if you cannot stand it, you will not be fit for an inheritance in the celestial kingdom of God. Now, this story is a powerful example of a people's heartstrings being wrenched, of faith being tested to its very limits. And the question that we've got to be asking ourselves over and over again throughout this story is, how did this test their faith? How was this circumstance a test of faith? And we're going to pick the story up back in Helaman chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, because we're not really going to understand the significance of this test of faith without including the prophecy that set the stage. So let's say that one day you decide to go to the market to pick up some food for your family. And you notice there's some commotion next to one of the walls of the city. You hear shouting. And so you go over and look up and there's a man on the wall. You recognize him. It's Samuel. Samuel, the Lamanite prophet. And he's preaching about a coming Savior that's going to be born in the old world to overcome death and sin for all mankind. And just at that moment, your neighbor walks up to you. And for argument's sake, let's say that he's a Gadianton robber, right? You know this, an unbeliever. And he looks at you and he says, you know what? You Christians have a convenient faith, don't you? Your Messiah is prophesied to be born far across the sea in a distant land where we can't even confirm whether it's actually happened or not. And you, you try to explain to them, what, well, you know, we believe that sometimes you just have to accept things on faith. And to that, he kind of scoffs at you and says, yeah, like I said, a convenient faith. But then, as you're both listening, Samuel says something that stops you and everybody else in their tracks. He says that there is going to be a sign here in the new world as evidence of this Savior's birth, an unmistakable sign. The crowd goes quiet as they listen intently to what Samuel says next. This is new. Prophets have prophesied the birth of a Savior for centuries, but nobody has ever said anything about a sign. And then the most amazing words come from Samuel's mouth. He says that in five years' time, on the night that the Savior is born in the old world, here there is going to be a day and a night and a day of light. In other words, he's saying that on that sacred night, the sun is going to go down, but it's not going to get dark. At that, everybody pauses. Your neighbor turns slowly to look at you and says, 
Now you don't believe that, do you? And now your faith is about to be tested. Do you believe Samuel's prophecy? That's the big question. And how is that a great test of faith? The sign itself. Well, because of all the unmistakable truths and facts about living on this planet, one of the foremost is that when the sun goes down, what happens? It gets dark. Of course it gets dark. And you may start to think, Samuel, couldn't we have picked a little bit more of a subtle sign? Why something so incredible, so hard to accept, so, so hard to believe? But let's suppose that you have that faith. And as hard as it is to accept, you look back at your neighbor and say, with a little tremor in your voice, yes, Samuel's a prophet. He would never say anything untrue. So if he says it's going to happen, it will happen. And at that, your neighbor smirks with a dismissive look and says, hmm, interesting. Meanwhile, the crowd around you becomes more and more restless. Some start to shout for Samuel to leave. And finally, somebody picks up a rock and throws it directly at Sam, but misses. This gives others the same idea, and pretty soon, before you know it, rocks and arrows are flying at Samuel from every direction. Miraculously, nobody can hit him. And here, your faith is strengthened. God protected him. His words must be true. But when Samuel finishes his message, what happens next? Helaman 16, 7-8. He jumps down from the wall, flees, and it says, He is never heard of more among the Nephites. Now, how would that test your faith? Samuel leaves. What's your daddy, aunt, and robber neighbor going to do with that? Well, he's going to accuse Samuel. See, your prophet is a coward. He has the nerve to come here, fill your minds full of lies, and then run off to abandon you to your foolishness. Now, you, you can't even go out and ask Samuel for more details. He, he's gone. But let's say that you maintain your faith. Plus, you've got Nephi, the great prophet. He's still there, living in Zarahemla, and he confirms the truthfulness of Samuel's words. And the years begin to pass. And you may not be too worried as the first, second, third, and fourth years come and go. But then the fifth year comes. And something interesting happens in that fifth year. Something happens to Nephi. What is it in 3 Nephi chapter 1, verses 2 through 3? One day in the fifth year, Nephi just up and leaves. He walks out of Zarahemla and into the forest, and he's never heard from again. How's that going to test your faith? Imagine what your neighbor is going to do with that. Let's say he comes over to your house and he casually asks, So, uh, where's your great prophet Nephi? And you say, Well, he left. Really? Where did he go? Um, well, we believe that, uh, you know, he was getting old and uh, he was translated. Translated? You mean, like, just take it up into heaven? Just whoosh, up he went? Yes. Oh, really? Wow, you sure about that? Did anybody see that happen? Mm, no. And then he gets more serious, and he says, You know what? Nephi wasn't translated. I'll tell you what happened to him. Isn't it obvious? He got out of Zarahemla before things get bad. He knows that this sign of yours is, is a big hoax, and he doesn't want to stick around for the consequences. I bet you anything that he's out there in the wilderness, roasting hot dogs with Sammy the Lamanite, laughing at you dumb people for being so gullible. Give up this silly belief. There's no way that the sun is going to go down and it not get dark. So again, your faith is being tested. And what do you say to that? 
Let's say that you stay firm. No, I believe in Nephi. And now his son, third Nephi, is the prophet and confirms the truthfulness of the sign. I believe the sign will come. And your neighbor gives you a bit of a half smile and says, hmm, well, I hope it does for your sake. And there's just a hint of a threat in his voice. Well, the fifth year comes and goes. And now the question is, where's the sign? Samuel said five years, and it hasn't come. How would that test your faith? It would have been nice had it happened by then. But you have to ask yourself what he meant by that. Did he mean within five years? Or five years would pass, and then the sign would come during the sixth year? Well, that's how you've got to interpret it, because five years are gone. But the unbelievers around you are starting to get restless. Look at verses 5 and 6. But there were some who began to say that the time was past for the words to be fulfilled, which were spoken by Samuel the Lamanite. And they began to rejoice over their brethren, saying, Behold, the time is past, and the words of Samuel are not fulfilled. Therefore your joy and your faith concerning this thing hath been vain. And they're saying that the time time's past. Samuel was lying. It's not true. And many people do begin to lose their faith. In fact, it gets so bad, the unbelievers become fed up with the foolishness of these silly Christians and their belief in a day and a night and a day of light. And so they make a decree. Look at verse 9. Now it came to pass that there was a day set apart by the unbelievers, that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death except the sign should come to pass, which had been given by Samuel the Lamb. So they set a date, and they say that if the sign doesn't occur by that time, then all those believers are going to be rounded up and killed. How would that test your faith? And what would you do? Your faith isn't just a matter of reputation anymore, but your life, the life of your spouse, your children, would you stay faithful under those circumstances? It's extremely difficult. But let's say that you do. You're the type that can maintain faith even under those difficult circumstances. And now, what are you doing every night besides praying? And now I like to jump back to verse 8 to describe what I imagine the believers doing. It holds a good description of what that day-to-day -day experience must have been like. But behold, they did watch steadfastly for that day and that night and that day which should be as one day as if there were no night, that they might know that their faith had not been vain. So what are you doing? You're watching sunsets. And every night you hope that it will happen. And you watch steadfastly the sun going down behind the horizon. And what happens every night? It gets dark. Right? Of course that's what happens. What else would it do? And how would that test your faith? Do you know what that's like? To have your hopes raised and dashed, raised and dashed, raised and dashed over and over again. That would be a trial of faith in and of itself. And when do you think the Lord is finally going to send the sign? Is it going to come months before the day set by the unbelievers for their death? Weeks? Days? No, nah, it comes to the last day, the final night, and the sign hasn't come yet. And we know this because Nephi goes out to pray for the people that are about to be destroyed. And he prays all that day. And how would that test your faith? Wow, talk about a trial. I could picture your neighbor coming over and saying, okay, you know, I've always kind of liked you, even though I think you're a fool. You know what? I can save you. I can save you and your family. Just deny it. Deny your belief in this Christ. Admit that the sign is a fraud. And I'll make sure that nothing happens to you. 
Would you keep your faith at that point? With your life on the line, your spouse's life, your children's. But let's say that you do maintain your faith. Perhaps you put your confidence in a God that will save you. Or perhaps you say, well, if it isn't true, then a world without Christ isn't a world that I want to live in anyway. And we don't know how this happened. But I picture the Gadians and robbers rounding up the, the believers, standing around them, sharpening their swords, just waiting for the sunset. And there you are, hugging your family, praying, and looking at the horizon. And I wish I could see this moment. Like I said earlier, in the next life, I want to see it because this has got to be one of the most dramatic moments in all of Scripture. And the Scriptures say in verse 15, And it came to pass that the words which came unto Nephi were fulfilled, according as they had been spoken. For behold, at the going down of the sun, there was no dark. And the people began to be astonished because there was no darkness when the night came. So everybody's watching. And the sun slowly dips below the horizon. And there's that moment where you're not sure what's going on, what's taking place. And you're waiting. Slowly begins to dawn on you. It's not getting dark lighter and lighter and all that fear the tension the doubts are instantly relieved in one miraculous moment your heartstrings which have been stretched to the absolute limit almost to the breaking point snap back into their original shape tensionless and you rejoice and you cry and you hug your family. Not only because you realize that you're not going to die. The Savior of the world has just been born. Perhaps you'd sit down with your children that night and explain to them the significance of a night without darkness. I really love that story. These people are such an amazing example of faith to me. And so, what's our truth? Just like the Nephites in 3 Nephi 1, our faith is going to be tested. If we maintain our faith like they did, we too will rejoice and have our faith confirmed. And taking it to heart, what impresses you most about the believing Nephites in this story? What has helped you to maintain your faith? during heartstring-wrenching times? And what blessings have come to you through your trials of faith? Now remember, according to Joseph Smith, we too will have to pass through great trials of faith. Our heartstrings are going to need to be wrenched. Perhaps you have already experienced some of this in your life, or you're currently facing something like that now. I hope that these Nephites have inspired you like they inspire me. In dark times, remember, the days of light will come. And if they could maintain their faith under those circumstances, hopefully we can do the same in ours, which are probably less by comparison. The scriptures often deal in extreme examples so that they can teach us by comparison. If they were able to do it in that circumstance, shouldn't I be able to bear up under mine? So don't give up. Don't give in. The Lord always keeps his promises, even when it doesn't seem possible, even when you feel your heartstrings have been wrenched to their limit. Keep the faith, because if those heartstrings of yours can hold, one day there will be a glorious release, and everything you've held to be true and sacrificed for will be miraculously and undeniably confirmed. Like a sunrise without sun. 
And so that's why I, like I said at the beginning, feel that the true spirit of Christmas is the spirit of receiving. But it's not about receiving presents. It's about receiving the Savior, receiving Christ into our lives and into our world, just like these faithful Nephites did. We even sing in a very well-known Christmas song, let earth receive her king. May we all receive our king, not just at Christmas, but every day of the year. Now, for the next part of this lesson, we're going to take a step back and try to look at the big picture. There is a message I see in these chapters that I feel is super relevant to us in the latter days and related to the message in chapter one. I call this section, Missing the Master. And the object of this lesson, a rope. Now, I'm a rock climber and a canyoneer, and so I've always got a lot of rope lying around. But just see if you can get even a small section of rope and have that ready for a point later in the lesson. And as an icebreaker, I usually like to share one of two different illustrations. One of those illustrations is from one of my favorite movies as a child. I love the movie, The Great Escape. And it, that movie depicts the efforts of a large number of allied POWs to escape from a German prisoner of war camp. And in one of the most famous scenes of the movie, you've got Steve McQueen on a motorcycle racing towards the Swiss border. And you know that if he can just get to the other side of the barbed wire fence, he'll be free. And he's being chased by a large number of German soldiers. And in a very exciting part, he jumps the motorcycle over a smaller fence. And all he has to do is somehow get past the bigger fence. But unfortunately, the soldiers catch up to him. He crashes his motorcycle into the fence. And there he is tangled in the barbed wire, just inches away from freedom. But they capture him, and they take him back to the POW camp. And your heart just aches because he got so close. He almost made it. Sometimes I'll even show that short clip in class. And here's a link to that clip if you're interested. Or I sometimes talk about one of the most exciting Super Bowls in American football that I've ever watched. The 2000 game between the Tennessee Titans and the St. Louis Rams. During the final drive, the Titans charge down the field all the way to the 10-yard line. And the game came down to the last play, with only six seconds left on the clock, and the Titans were down by one touchdown and one last chance to stay in it. The quarterback threw a quick pass to their star receiver, who looked like he was going to easily just run into the end zone when he's tackled just one yard short. One lousy yard. And I remember the image of the receiver reaching his arm out with the football, just trying to stretch those last few inches into the end zone. But sadly, he fell short. Again, heartbreaking to get so close to victory and lose. And if you're interested, I'll include a link to a short video that shows that final play. Well, those two scenarios come to mind when I think of the first chapters of 3 Nephi. Keep in mind the setting. After the miraculous sign of Christ's birth that we just discussed, there's massive conversion, right? The unbelievers have been proven wrong. Samuel was right. Faith has been confirmed. Therefore, they can all rest assured that Samuel is also going to be right about the sign of Christ's death and his visit to the Americas. Now, the catch is that they don't know exactly when the destruction and the darkness and the visit is going to come. But they can safely assume that it's going to fall into the normal lifespan of a, of a person. But exactly how many years Christ is going to live before he's crucified? They don't know that. 
Now we know, we have the benefit of hindsight. We know that it's going to come in the year 34 AD. On the fourth day of the first month, to be exact, as it says in chapter 8, verse 5. So in 1 AD, the year of the sign, the majority of the Nephites and Lamanites are righteous. And they've just got to hang in there until 34 AD. And shortly after all of that, they do have some big problems with the Gadianton robbers. There's some wars. But under the righteous leadership of the governor Laconius and the prophet Gidgadoni, they conquer and eliminate the Gadianton robber threat. We'll talk about that story later. But then look at how Mormon describes the people at this point. Many years after the sign is passed in 3 Nephi 5, 1 through 3. And now behold, there was not a living soul among all the people of the Nephites who did doubt in the least the words of all the holy prophets who had spoken. For they knew that it must needs be that they must be fulfilled. And they knew that it must be expedient that Christ had come because of the many signs which had been given, according to the words of the prophets. And because of the things which had come to pass already, they knew that it must needs be that all things should come to pass according to that which had been spoken. Therefore, they did forsake all their sins and their abominations and their whoredoms and did serve God with all diligence day and night. So they're really doing well. It almost sounds like hyperbole. They're so good. Not a living soul that didn't believe. They knew that the signs must be fulfilled. They, they're serving God with diligence day and night. They're prepared. They're ready. They're righteous. Take note of the year. At the beginning of chapter 5, what year is it in the chapter heading? 22 AD. So how many more years do they have to stay righteous? to enjoy the glorious experience with the Savior. The sign comes in 34 AD, so just 12 more years. And now Mormon is basically going to give us a year-by-year -year countdown to the year 34 AD. And in my mind's eye, I can just picture some giant stands in the air filled with a cheering section of angels looking down and shouting, Come on, Nephites, you can do it. You can make it. Hang in there for just 12 more years. You can last 12 more years, can't you? If you do, you'll survive the destruction. You'll get to meet Jesus. You and your children and your grandchildren are going to grow up in a righteous millennial-type era. 12 years. Come on. So let's envision this as a timeline. And I've made a handout of this. And you could walk your students through it, having them mark the timeline their scriptures with either a smiley face or a frowny face, based on whether the people are righteous or wicked at that point. So at 22 AD, we can put a smiley face because we know that they've begun righteous. Now let's go to chapter 5, verse 7, which will quickly describe the next four years. And thus had the twenty and second year passed away, and the twenty and third year also, and the twenty and fourth and the twenty and fifth, and thus had twenty and five years passed away. So, no change. They continue in righteousness until the twenty-fifth year. Smiley face. Now they're just eight years away. Go to chapter six, verses four and five, for a description of the next two years. And they began again to prosper and to wax great. And the twenty and sixth and seventh years passed away. And there was great order in the land, and they had formed their laws according to equity and justice. And now there was nothing in all the land to hinder the people from prospering continually, except they should fall into transgression. So, still good. Smiley face. Although some foreshadowing in that fifth verse. Maybe. But now they only have six years to go. Hang in there, Nephites. Chapter 6, verse 9. And thus passed away the twenty and eighth year, and the people had continual peace. Smiley face. They're going to do it. Just five years to go. Now, chapter 6, verses 10 through 16 for the next year. But. 
Ah, no, I hate that word. Don't do this to me, Nephites. But it came to pass in the twenty and ninth year, there began to be some disputings among the people. And some were lifted up unto pride and boastings because of their exceedingly great riches, yea, even unto great persecutions. For there were many merchants in the land, and also many lawyers and many officers. And the people began to be distinguished by ranks, according to their riches and their chances for learning. Yea, some were ignorant because of their poverty, and others did receive great learning because of their riches. Some were lifted up in pride, and others were exceedingly humble. Some did return railing for railing, while others would receive railing and persecution and all manner of afflictions, and would not turn and revile again, but were humble and penitent before God. And thus there became a great inequality in all the land, insomuch that the church began to be broken up. Ah, I hate to read this. Yea, insomuch that in the thirtieth year the church was broken up in all the land, save it were among a few of the Lamanites who were converted unto the true faith, and they would not depart from it, for they were firm and steadfast and immovable, willing with all diligence to keep the commandments of the Lord. Now the cause of this iniquity of the people was this. Satan had great power unto the stirring up of the people to do all manner of iniquity, and to the puffing them up with pride, tempting them to seek for power, and authority, and riches, and the vain things of the world. And thus Satan did lead away the hearts of the people to do all manner of iniquity. Therefore they had enjoyed peace but a few years. Ah, so tragic! With just five years left, they blow it. They fall apart. And we have to put a frowny face on our chart now. The majority of them are wicked. The angels in the stands drop their flags and their pom-poms, and they let out a collective, oh. However, we can also say that they still have five years to repent. The game isn't quite over yet. These people do seem to fluctuate between wickedness and righteousness. Maybe they can turn it around. That's what we've got to hope for now. Let's see if they can fix things in the next year. Chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. And thus in the commencement of the thirtieth year, the people having been delivered up for the space of a long time to be carried about by the temptations of the devil, whithersoever he desired to carry them, and to do whatsoever iniquity he desired they should. And thus in the commencement of this, the thirtieth year, they were in a state of awful wickedness. Now they did not sin ignorantly, for they knew the will of God concerning them for it had been taught unto them. Therefore, they did willfully rebel against God. And it had gotten worse in the next year. Awful wickedness. Willful rebellion. It's not looking good. Maybe the next year? Chapter 7 covers those last years. Verse 14 tells us, And it came to pass in the thirty and first year that they were divided into tribes, every man according to his family, kindred, and friends. Nevertheless, they had come to an agreement that they would not go to war one with another. But they were not united as to their laws and their manner of government, for they were established according to the minds of those who were their chiefs and their leaders. But they did establish very strict laws that one tribe should not trespass against another, insomuch that in some degree they had peace in the land. Nevertheless, their hearts were turned from the Lord their God, and they did stone the prophets and did cast them out from among them. So the government is dissolved. Everybody splits into tribes, and they're stoning and casting out prophets. And that basically continues into the 32nd year, as you see in verse 23. Thus passed away the 30 and 2nd year also. So not much change. And Nephi did cry unto the people in the commencement of the 30 and 3rd year, and he did preach unto them repentance and remission of sins. So, during that time, Nephi, the great prophet, is out there teaching powerfully to the people, performing miracles. He even raises his brother from the dead. The last year, and remember, they, they don't know that, but the destruction is going to come right at the beginning of the 34th year. 
and because of Nephi's powerful teaching. Look at the last verse of chapter 7. And there were many in the commencement of this year that were baptized unto repentance. Thus the more part of the year did pass away. So, yay, some change. There are a number of people who repent, but the majority is still living in wickedness. Now you look at that timeline and it just breaks your heart, doesn't it? They get so close. Because at the chapter heading of chapter 8, you've got tempests, earthquakes, fires, whirlwinds, all the destruction and darkness that Samuel had prophesied all those years before. If they could just have hung on a little longer, many of those people could have experienced one of the greatest events in all of human history. It could have survived the destruction and the darkness. And we know that because the voice out of the darkness after the destruction in 3 Nephi 9 verse 13 says, O all ye that are spared, because ye were more righteous than they. They didn't die because they were more righteous. The destruction was selective, not random. Those people could have seen the Savior, touched the wounds in his side and hands and feet. They would have witnessed his blessings and teachings. They would have been a part of the happiest time in all the Book of Mormon, described in 4th Nephi. But they missed it. Just barely. Ah, if only they could have hung on a little longer. I wonder what was going through their minds when the storms started when the building was toppling down on them, as the wave crashed over their heads, as the whirlwind was carrying them away, as they were trapped by the flames. Regret? A wish that they could go back? The sobering thought that they knew this was coming and that they almost made it. But they missed the Master by such a small margin. On the other hand, what about that group of people that repented in the last year, in the 33rd year? What must have been going through their minds? Oh, thank heaven I repented. I'm so glad I changed in time. I was close. They must have lived the rest of their lives forever grateful that they decided to make that change just in the nick of time. Well, let's take this story and apply it to us. Do we ever find ourselves in similar situations? And how? Here's a few suggestions. Sometimes it's our righteousness that we need to maintain amongst worldly influence. And this is particularly relevant to the youth. I'll often tell my students that if they can just get through high school, if they can just hang in there and tell the mission field, or to a temple marriage. They should be much better off the rest of their lives. No 100% guarantees, right? But if you can get there, you've won a major victory in your spiritual life, and you've stacked the odds in your favor. But, oh, how tragic is it when I see seniors who have lived exemplary lives to that point fall apart their senior year or their first year of college. I won't give you specific examples, but trust me, I've seen that happen more often than I care to admit to students that I really care about. And I say, oh, if you could have just hung on a little longer, you were so close, like the Tennessee Titans or Steve McQueen in The Great Escape. Sometimes I'll say to my freshmen, just like the Nephites, you've got four years of high school. Hang on during those four years. Stay righteous. Maintain your faith and standards. You can do it. Sometimes it's a trial that we need to endure. Perhaps the solution to that great test or challenge in your life is just around the corner. Maybe that job offering is coming soon. Perhaps the cure is just about to present itself. Maybe the answer that will solve your relationship conflicts is just about to come. Perhaps the resolution to your problems is it's just around the corner. So don't give up. Don't lose your faith. Don't quit before the solution comes. And I know that's hard when you don't know when the solution is going to come, whether it's days or years. 
but it will come. God promises that at some point in our lives, all pain, all sorrow, all problems will come to a resolution. We've just got to hang on until they do. Sometimes it's a promised blessing that we need to wait for. Oh, my patriarchal blessing says that I'm going to have this opportunity. Why hasn't it presented itself yet? I've been a good person. When will I find a covenant spouse? I've been told that if I pray and exercise faith, an answer will come. Why hasn't it yet? I thought happiness was the result of righteousness. Why am I miserable, even though I'm choosing the right? I really want a testimony of certain things. I'm working to gain a testimony. Why won't Heavenly Father confirm it? There's lots of times when we're going to have to wait patiently on the Lord for promised blessings. I love the example of Abraham and Sarah in the Old Testament who were promised a child. It wasn't until Abraham was a hundred and Sarah was 90 when that blessing came. That's waiting patiently on the Lord. And then in a very literal sense, we're all in the exact same position as these Nephites. We too are waiting for the coming of Christ. And we also don't know exactly when it's going to happen. We know it's coming. Are we going to hang on? Are we going to maintain our righteousness until he comes? Or are we going to miss the master by just a few years? Will we survive the destruction and get the opportunity to see Christ when he comes again? I hope so. I hope that we're all in that group. So what's the principle of the lesson? The truth? Well, how would you finish this? I, I'll put up some whens. When I don't feel like I can maintain my righteousness when the wickedness of the world surrounds me. When I don't feel like I can maintain my faith through a difficult challenge or trial. When I feel like I've waited so long for a promised blessing to come and it's nowhere in sight. When the second coming seems so distant. If I, then. How would you finish those statements? No right or wrong answer here, really. But I'll share how I would finish it. If I hang on, if I continue in faith, if I push forward, if I remain patient, then the promised blessings will come. Take it to heart. Have you ever seen the truthfulness of that principle? Have you ever had a time when you waited patiently on the Lord? And eventually, the blessings did come. Please share. Well, there's an old proverb of the American West that I love. And this is where I take out my rope and say, what do you do when you get to the end of your rope? What's the proverb? They say, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. And at that point, I tie a knot in the end of the rope. And how's that going to help? A knot gives you something to grip makes it easier to hang on. So tie a knot in the end of your rope of faith. Or we could also phrase this in Book of Mormon terms and say, hang on until the 34th year. If any of you are finding yourselves in one of the situations that we just talked about, please hang on. You never know what's just around the corner. The 34th year will come. No doubt. So hang on. Yes. Well, I believe that those two messages stand out to me as the most significant from these chapters. However, there's more in here. Chapters 3 and 4 are reminiscent of the war chapters, and they've got some positive principles for us to learn here as well. We're not going to go into as deep of a discussion here, but I've got an activity for you that could summarize some of the big ideas. For an icebreaker, choose a competitive sport or a game that you enjoy and talk about it a little bit. And then for an object, bring in something that you use while playing that sport or game. Like a ball, a racket, a pair of special shoes, a deck of cards, you know, anything associated with that activity. Then share a strategy 
or a tactic that you use that helps you to win. Now, for me, I'm not much into competitive sports. I like doing things in the outdoors. But I do enjoy a good game of racquetball now and then. And one of the strategies that I like to use that helps me to win more games is my favorite serve, which is called the Z serve. And what you do is with a little bit of a spin on the ball, you hit it into the front corner, which then bounces off the side and travels to the opposite back corner. And what's cool is if you do this right, instead of bouncing off the side wall at an angle, like you would expect, it almost magically shoots straight off of the wall because of the spin. Now that can really throw your opponent off and often results in an ace serve, as long as you don't do it too much. Now you as a teacher are going to have different interests and tactics that you could share. Just pick one, whether it's football, basketball, or maybe it's a strategy in a board game like Monopoly or a card game, and then share one of your favorite winning strategies. Or invite your students to share something like that. Well, here in these initial chapters of 3rd Nephi, we see both negative and positive strategies being used in trying to win over the hearts of the people. The negative strategies, the kind that Satan uses to defeat righteousness, are well exemplified by the leader of the Gadianton robbers, a man by the name of Gideon, who's attacking the righteous people of Zarahemla. And he employs a number of of satanic sneaky strategies in a letter that he writes to Laconius, the governor of the land. That letter is found in chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. I'm not going to focus so much on the negative here and cover that letter in detail, other than to tell you to look for those strategies. Some of the ones that I see are flattery, defeatism, skepticism, sarcasm, accusation, intimidation, and making evil look good. The adversary continues to be a master at employing these strategies in our day, and his legions are always ready to await the command of their leader to come out and destroy us. Therefore, we need to be prepared. We need to have some strategies of our own to protect ourselves. And this is where I'd like to focus our attention. Laconius is a powerful example of what I would call terrific tactics for the trustworthy. He does a number of things to protect his people physically that I believe will also work to protect ourselves spiritually. Let's see how. And I've devised this discussion as a matching activity handout. Match the identified verses with the picture that you feel best represents the tactic being employed in that verse. Here are the answers. Verse 12. And you'll notice that I have two pictures that go with this verse. What are they? Now behold, this Laconius, the governor, was a just man and could not be frightened by the demands and the threatenings of a robber. Therefore he did not hearken to the epistle of Gideon, the governor of the robbers. But he did cause that his people should cry unto the Lord for strength against the time that the robbers should come down against them. He could not be frightened by the demands and threatenings of a robber. The first picture match is the lion, E. We too, like Laconius, need to be brave and courageous in the face of intimidation and accusation. We too can seek to be brave in the face of the adversary. Satan thrives on our fears. Fear of not fitting in. Fear of failure. Fear of challenge. Fear of loneliness. Fear that the gospel isn't true. And he seeks to mobilize these fears in an effort to move us towards sin. We've got to be more valiant than that. Choose faith, not fear. Another in verse 12, cry unto the Lord for strength. That's prayer. The praying hands is the match. D, consistent and sincere prayer is going to give us the strength that we need to stand for. Now verses 13 and 21. Yea, he sent a proclamation among all the people that they should gather together their women and their children, their flocks and their herds and all their substance, save it were their land unto one place. 21. But Gidgudoni saith unto them, The Lord forbid, for if we should go up against them, the Lord would deliver us into their hands. Therefore, we will prepare ourselves in the center of our lands, and we will gather all our armies together, and we will not go against them, but we will wait till they shall come against us. Therefore, 
as the Lord liveth. If we do this, he will deliver them into our hands. And this is such a good one. There is strength in numbers. We need to gather ourselves together into the center of our spiritual lands. The picture would be of the four arrows pointing inward. B. We need to gather as families, gather as wards, gather as a church, gather with other like-minded friends. We're stronger together than we are alone. No wonder we have so many activities and meetings in the church. The more we're together, the better able we'll be to fend off the enemy. Verse 14, And he caused that fortifications should be built round about them, and the strength thereof should be exceedingly great. And he caused that armies, both of the Nephites and of the Lamanites, or of all them who were numbered among the Nephites, should be placed as guards round about to watch them, and to guard them from the robbers day and night. The match is the wall here. See, we can fortify ourselves. What are some of the things that fortify you? Scripture study? Temple worship? Church attendance? Committing to the standards and the strength of you? Seminary, institute, gospel study. There's many things that we can do to fortify ourselves against the adversary. Also in verse 14, the picture of the guard, F. And who are our guards? We too need guards to protect and help us, and God sends us guards. We've got the brethren of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. We have bishoprics, Relief Society presidencies, young women's and young men's leaders, seminary teachers, institute teachers, Sunday school teachers, many guards to help keep us safe and protect us from evil. Verse 15, Yea, he said unto them, As the Lord liveth, except ye repent of all your iniquities and cry unto the Lord, ye will in no wise be delivered out of the hands of those Gadianton robbers. The picture here, G, the hands washing as a symbol for repentance. We've got to repent. We're all going to have some weaknesses and stain our clothing with the soil of sin. But we go to the washer, the cleaner, the caretaker, who purifies us and washes us clean. I can't expect the Lord to deliver me out of Satan's hands if I'm not willing to stop the things that Satan's trying to to use to destroy me. Verse 19. Now it was the custom among all the Nephites to appoint for their chief captains, save it were in their times of wickedness, someone that had the spirit of revelation and also prophecy. Therefore, this Gidgadoni was a great prophet among them, as also was the chief judge. I love this. Who do they choose to be their leader in battle? One that had the spirit of revelation and prophecy a man that was a great prophet among them. Who do we choose to be the chief captains of our generation? Hopefully, the apostles, prophets, the general authorities, church leaders, those that have the Spirit of the Lord with them. And they will lead us victoriously into battle. The picture match is of President Nelson. H. And finally, verse 26. And they were exceedingly sorrowful because of their enemies, and Gidgadoni did cause that they should make weapons of war of every kind, and they should be strong with armor, and with shields, and with bucklers, after the manner of his instruction. The match would be the swords. We too need to arm ourselves. With what? How about the armor of God, and all that it represents? We'll more successfully face our enemies if we can clothe ourselves with righteousness, truth, salvation the preparation of the gospel of peace, faith, the Spirit, and the Word of God. These are protections and weapons that cannot be taken lightly. I can't imagine walking out into a battlefield without armor, without a weapon. Be foolish. Well, what was the result of all this preparation made by Gidgadoni, Laconius, and the people? Chapter 4 is where the war actually begins. And both sides are strong. But whose strategies are going to prove to be better? Whose tactics are going to bring success? What are the final results of the conflict? Summarize. Chapter 4, verse 10. They were prepared to meet them. Verse 12. The Nephites did beat them, insomuch that they did fall back from before them. So They win. They defeat the robbers. Therefore, verses 30 and 31. And they did rejoice and cry again with one voice, saying, May the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob 
protect this people in righteousness, so long as they shall call on the name of their God for protection. And it came to pass that they did break forth, all as one, in singing and praising their God for the great thing which he had done for them, in preserving them from falling into the hands of their enemies. In the verse 33, And their hearts were swollen with joy, unto the gushing out of many tears, because of the great goodness of God, in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. And they knew it was because of their repentance and their humility that they had been delivered from an everlasting destruction. All right. Well, our truth, if I use the same terrific tactics employed by Gidgadoni and his people, then I too will win my spiritual battles. Taking it to heart, which of the terrific tactics have helped you most in your spiritual battles and how? Well, I believe that truly these same kinds of results will be ours if we follow these strategies. And instead of winning at racquetball, monopoly, or basketball, we will win the game of life. And how satisfying is it going to be to look at the adversary and say, you lose. Your strategies didn't work on me. We win. I pray that that victory will be yours. That is going to conclude our lessons for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, if you felt the Spirit, if you felt like you learned something, if you felt there was value in what you heard today, I invite you to to subscribe, to hit the like button. Most of all, to share with somebody else that you feel this could help. Now, thank you so much for watching. Now, get out there and teach with